All right, we're going to get started. So good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us for today's Lunch and Learn presentation as part of Lake Friendly Living Awareness Month. Um, today's event is Nature-Based Shorelines for Lake Friendly Living, and it's co-sponsored by the Canandaigua Lake Watershed Association and the Honeyway Valley Association, our neighboring Finger Lake. And this is part of the month-long series of educational events focused on watershed resiliency to help protect our Finger Lakes. My name is Lindsay McMillan. I'm the Association Director here for the Canandaigua Lake Watershed Association. Um, and I also want to recognize Don Cook, who seems to maybe have gone off the screen for a moment, but uh, Don Cook is a board member of the Honeyway Valley Association and is also very involved with the New York State Federation of Lake Associations. So thanks for joining us, Don. So here you're going to see a map of all the different partners that make up uh, the Lake Friendly Living Coalition of the Finger Lakes. Uh, we formed uh, several years ago, I believe 2019. And we've now expanded to include nine lakes across the region. So hopefully you see your lake on the map here today. And so each watershed is unique in its characteristics, but we all share similar concerns about the threats that we face as a region, including harmful algal blooms, uh, increased nutrient loading, invasive species, and the impacts that we're seeing from climate change. And so we, as a coalition, recognize there's strength in numbers and that collectively we can make a greater impact working together uh, to tackle some of these big issues and communicate with the public. So we've had a uh, great involvement so far with our monthly educational series and we still have a few weeks left to go. So uh, I wanted to put a plug in for uh, everybody to stay connected to our schedule of events that's remaining throughout the course of the month and uh, feel free to either join a virtual event or do an in-person event that interests you. Uh, actually, this weekend, we have two great in-person events coming up. On Saturday, the Cuca Lake Association will be hosting a live macro invertebrate collection demonstration in Sugar Creek down in Branchport. So that should be a really great event. Um, and on Sunday, the Watershed Association uh, from Canandaigua is hosting a spotted lanternfly workshop uh, with invasive species expert, Matt Gallo. And that's going to be held at the Heron Hill Tasting Room. So we invite you to join us, learn more about what you can do to help fight uh, the spotted lanternfly, and uh, stay for a complimentary glass of wine after the event. So feel free to visit the Finger Lakes Regional Watershed Alliance website to register for these great events and check out all the other ones we have coming up the remainder of the month. There's some really good ones. And so before I introduce Elena for today's talk, just a couple of quick housekeeping items. We are recording this session and we'll make it available to the public afterwards. Uh, we do ask that all attendees just remain muted during the presentation. Mm. This helps limit the yeah. feedback and the background noise. And we're gonna have time at the end for a question and answer with Elena. And we encourage you to use the chat feature. I know there's a Q and A in the chat. The chat's a little bit easier for us to manage, so please uh, feel free to pop your questions in there and we'll get to some towards the end. Mm -hmm. And then uh, one other just kind of a fun announcement. Since Elena is going to be taking some time towards the end of her presentation to discuss uh, best shoreline practices, we thought this would be a good time to remind folks of one easy conversion that you can make today to make an impact on the lake, which is switching to LED flares uh, from the traditional flares uh, this summer. We know many lakes have ring of fire celebrations, other ho holiday celebrations on their lakes. Um, so switching to LEDs for these events is an easy way to just keep harmful chemical residue uh, from combustible flares out of our waterways. So uh, I just wanna let you know that all attendees to today's webinar are gonna be entered into a drawing to win a set of LED flares courtesy of Flaregate. So we'll do a drawing at the end of the event and we will notify the winner over email. Okay, so let's get into today's uh, presentation, which is what you're all here for today. Uh, we welcome today's presenter, presenter, Elena Robarge. She is the Conservation District Educator for the Ontario County Soil and Water Conservation District. And she's been with the district for almost four years now. Uh, and when we think about what it takes to build resiliency and to protect our watersheds across the Finger Lakes, our local county soil and water districts are really key to some of these successes. 
So during this talk, we look forward to learning more about the important role that Ontario County soil and water plays in our region um, and learn more about best shoreline practices. So we welcome Elena Robarge today. Thank you. Pull up my screen. All right. Lindsay, can you see my screen? Yep, looks good. All right, great. Everybody else see it? There we go. To be good. All right. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm going to talk a little bit about nature-based shorelines for lake-friendly living. I want to start just a little bit on some of the basics that soil and water conservation districts do. And then, as Lindsay said, kind of wrap it up with some lake-friendly living practices uh, that we can all do, no matter where we live. So we each have an impact on our environment. So that includes our wildlife, our waterways, our drinking water, and our homes. As we all know, all our waterways are connected. Um, that's why you're all here today because you're um, conscious of our watersheds and you love living in the Finger Lakes region. Um, so we all know that a watershed is the land that drains to the lowest point in the landscape where water collects. Um, absolutely everybody lives in a watershed. It's a really good idea to know which watershed you live in. And don't forget about the water that's under your feet because our groundwater is also moving to our lakes. Um, so it's really important to just protect all of our waterways, uh, whether you live inland quite a bit or if you're right on the shoreline of one of our finger lakes. I will use the word stormwater a lot. So that's all that water rushing off our surfaces um, during a rain event or when snow is melting in the spring, particularly over our impervious surfaces like our roads and parking lots. So what's really great about our area is that everyone wants to live here. Like we have a beautiful region. Um, people are moving here. They're building new properties all the time. Um, and that's awesome for our economy. It's awesome for our community. Um, but it does bring along with it more impervious surfaces. So more surfaces that water cannot infiltrate through, such as our parking lots, our roads, sidewalks, um, and our roofs particularly. So just some changes over time. This is a, like an image um, near Canandaigua where before we had, you know, a bunch of farm fields that when it would rain, it would kind of soak up into the soil, whether it was a hay field or maybe even a forested property, it would kind of soak it up like a sponge. But over time, we've obviously had more development. So now there's a housing development and we're still getting those same um, storms. Sometimes even it seems we're getting stronger storms and more water um, in our environment that we have to deal with. And so now that water is rushing across the surfaces and finding a place it can soak into. Um, same here, just a, a lot of farm fields and forested, forests that um, are now a developed property, which is perfectly fine. We just need to make sure that we're um, doing the best management practices for that stormwater. So we are getting more water and it has less places for it to go. So I talked a little bit about like that sponge, right? We want to build a better sponge. Um, so we want to increase retention of water, increase infiltration of water and treatment. So if you kind of think about your property as a sponge and how it has a huge impact on our local water quality, um, it kind of gives you an idea of what we want to do with that water. Each and every one of us wants a better future, right? Whether you have a property on the shoreline where you want to, um, keep it for years and years to come and maybe give it to the next generation. Uh, we wanna make sure our, our water quality and our wildlife is all flourishing for generations to come. So at Soil and Water, uh, we use the word green infrastructure a lot, and it has been used more frequently in the news and um, in different projects and different grants that are coming out um, to implement more green infrastructure. So some examples of that would be possibly porous pavement. Um, you can see on the left-hand side of your screen, that's porous pavement being installed over at FLCC. We had some grant funding for that. Uh, a rain garden, this at the bottom picture kind of shows a big rain garden installed at FLCC that handles a lot of the water that's flowing off of CMAC, the big hill there. 
and it's going to soak it up like a sponge. Um, a rain garden is something you could do at home on a very small scale. Um, and if you want to know more about that, I can, I can get you more information. And then we do have a sediment trap there in the right, and I'll talk about that in a little while. But the whole goal of green infrastructure projects is to decrease our impervious surfaces, slow down that stormwater, and allow for infiltration. And additional water is really tough on our infrastructure. And that has a lot to do with our public safety, our roadways, our community. So we have to kind of come up as a, a community and figure out what we're gonna do um, about all of this damage that we're getting from big storms and make sure that we're doing the best, um, best possible management practices. So at Soil and Water, uh, we're always uh, promoting the use of construction site best management practices. Um, so we have several certified um, inspectors in our office that go out and do stormwater inspections on certain properties um, that require it based on the size of the project um, and make sure they're implementing their stormwater best management practices. There's erosion and sediment control practices because these are all really bad examples. Um, this is not what we wanna see, right? A sediment, is just as much of a pollutant, right? We do not need extra sediment going into our waterways, carrying extra nutrients, affecting our fish and wildlife habitat, um, affecting our spawning grounds. Um, so sediment is a really big deal. So at Soil and Water, we have several um, four-hour courses every year, which are New York State Department of Environmental Conservation Erosion and Sediment Control Trainings. Those are our four-hour courses, and so those are for local municipalities and local um, uh, construction workers that really, um, it it, this is a certification that's required to take every three years for um, certain employees to make sure that they're implementing all those stormwater best management practices. And then we work with the Ontario Wayne Stormwater Coalition and I do um, an annual training for all the municipalities within that coalition, just to, it's like good reminders on the best things they can do every day on their job to make sure they're protecting our stormwater. We have tons of agricultural projects um, going on, um, tons of different programs and different grant funding we have access to. The AIM program is like one of the most common ag programs throughout the state, which is the Agricultural Environmental Management Program. Uh, the core concepts of that is it's voluntary, it's incentive-based. We develop incredible partnerships with our local farmers. They are working so hard to try to keep their soil on their farm and protect our local waterways. So um, using the AIM program is a great way um, to get these, these projects out on the farm. So I just included this slide to just show you how many different options, and there's even more options of projects we can help implement out on the farm. Um, so an AIM program can start just basic, talking with the farmer about their goals and what they want to do. And then it can also go through the whole tier system where we're actually implementing a project, like something like this um, on their farm. This is an example of a local um, farm field that had some major erosion going on. That's our technician Tucker, and it's almost the gully erosion is almost as tall as Tucker. And then this is the after. So we put in a beautiful grass waterway um, with some grant funding, and it was just an incredible project to prevent any future erosion. Just last year, we put in um, a mile and a half of grass waterways in our county. And um, just within last year, over 3,000 tons of soil was saved from runoff with the projects we did. So really cool things that we're doing um, on the farm level. Same with uh, soil health. You've probably all kind of heard a lot about the soil health practices in our county. Um, we even have a soil health workshop every year. This is an example of interseeded cover crop, which actually is a rye and radish mix that's being interseeded between the corn rows when it's really small, allowing for the light to kind of get the cover crop established. And then this is a really cool picture of that mix, that cover crop mix in early October after the corn harvest. So the corn has been harvested and they've got this beautiful cover crop um, to last all winter long and keep that all that soil and that nutrients on the field where it should be. 
This is an upland water retention. So just last year, um, we helped store um, 1,840,000 gallons of upland water um, on ag lands, which is really cool. The before picture above is all that water rushing off those farm fields. Um, and now it has a place to sit, slowly infiltrate and just and soak it up like a sponge, like we talked about before. Hydra seeding, this is something that you could even um, rent um, or have done um, from a local business or something. If you have ground that needs to be stabilized, hydra seeding is an amazing um, tool that we use. Uh, we actually bought a hydra seeder for Ontario County Highway Department with some grant funding a few years ago. And so they use it for, especially when they're cleaning out ditches to then get vegetation established as soon as possible. And then we they help us um, hydra seed areas for projects that we've recently installed too. So it's a great partnership we have with them. But hydra seeding is a really great tool to get that vegetation established very quickly. Um, and it's a vegetation is absolutely key. And I'll talk about that all throughout the presentation is that when you want to prevent erosion um, and loss of sediment and, and nutrients, um, getting vegetation established is, is critical. And you always want to use native plants. We have our septic inspection programs. Um, you may have met some of our inspectors before. We have Tad who manages the uniform procedures program. And then we have Tyler who manages the Canada Will Lake watershed inspection program. So Tyler would manage any property within the watershed. Um, sometimes it's because of a deed transfer, they need an inspection. Maybe it's because it's a rental property. Maybe it's the proximity of um, they, that property is to the lake um, and wants to make sure that that septic system is properly functioning. And the same for TAD, there's certain towns that require um, septic inspections, same again for rental property or deed transfers. Um, and that's a great way to catch problems um, before uh, they have a new owner or um, however the town requires it. But that's a really great program to make sure that we're not polluting our groundwater. This is an example of a dye test. So this is a real example uh, where Tad would have uh, flushed either the dye in the toilet or maybe drained it down the sink and was trying to figure out where it's going. And it was actually going to a pipe in the backwoods. So obviously that septic system is not functioning properly. And that's a really really bad thing, obviously, for our environment. That's a lot of nutrients, a lot of bacteria and pathogens that was going directly into our waterways. A properly functioning septic system um, can work very effectively at eliminating um, pollutants. Here's another example of a an improperly functioning septic system using red dye, and it was all that waste is going directly into the roadside ditch. All right. So I want to talk about floodplains because this is so important. Uh, a floodplain is that land that's adjacent to that waterway. It's formed mainly of river sediments and any and is subject to flooding, right? It's designed to flood. You can kind of see in the picture where there's that kind of flat area. Um, and if water has been there before, it's going to be there again. And that's the whole key with floodplains is um, we want to preserve our floodplains because if we build in a floodplain, and we have a big storm event, that water can be right in our in our basement if we're right there in the floodplain. It can cause issues to our roads, can cause issues to our infrastructure if we're building within that floodplain. So we wanna preserve our floodplain. Um, you can kind of look if you're if you find if you're out on a hike or it's near your house or something and you want to kind of explore it a little bit more look at the floodplain look at the size of the stone or debris in the channel bed um, because that's the extent um, of the force of of a big storm event what that water can carry so you really want to make sure we obviously if you live near a, a shoreline or a stream or something you know that water can be very damaging so we want to take uh, water very seriously. So a floodplain provides that natural space to dissipate that flood energy and that vegetation holds that soil in place. So these are so important to preserve. Um, it really will help um, everything downstream if it has a proper floodplain uh, to kind of settle out and slowly infiltrate through the soil like that sponge we talked about. 
So you've probably heard of the Hanoi Inlet Restoration Project. This was a really cool project we did a few years ago with lots of different partners that made it possible. Um, and it's not on state land. So it's something if you haven't checked it out, go hike it one day, bring your bring your muck boots and um, a really cool project to, to see um, implemented. Uh, the goals of the project was to allow water to slow down and spread out like on that floodplain that we just talked about. You want to use nature to filter out those sediments and those nutrients before it gets into Hanoi Lake um, and it increases the opportunities for recreation and improves habitat for fish and other wildlife species. So you can kind of see this is the before picture. So this is like in the planning stages. Um, historically, this was used for agriculture and they had kind of straightened out the channel over time and, and created agricultural ditches. So they're really straight channels to, to manage the, um, the drainage in those fields. Um, but now that it's this beautiful property of state land that we wanna recreate on, have wildlife and hopefully filter out sediments and nutrients before it gets to the lake, we wanna bring back those natural meanders in the channel. We've plugged a few ditches, we reconnected the flow to the floodplain, uh, constructed a backwater wetland. And then this is kind of what you get. So we had lots of plantings, um, lots of people made this, this project possible. So you can kind of see in the bottom right-hand corner, those natural meanders of that channel were brought back. All right. So that's a really cool drone image of the inlet that was taken by the Nature Conservancy. And then just last year, our district bought a drone. So we were able to go out after a big storm event in the fall. And that is the floodplains at work. You can really see where all that water was able to settle out and it will slowly soak it up like a sponge um, and filter out those nutrients rather than it just rushing into uh, Honeyway Lake. Very cool project. These sediment traps that I kind of mentioned before, you can see these along County Road 36. Maybe if you're on your way down to the Honeyway Inlet, you can go check these out. Um, but slow down water and drainage waste. So these are alongside the ditch. So if you imagine the water kind of flowing into them, slowing down, um, and then there's two small holes kind of at the bottom of it. Um, I don't know if you can kind of see my mouse, but it's two little holes where that water can slowly infiltrate through and it leaves behind that sediment or any debris. And then these can be cleaned out with a standard ditching bucket and our county highway department maintains these. So really cool opportunity to catch a lot of that sediment and nutrients before it enters Honey Oil Lake. This is a picture of it after a big storm event. So you can see where that water, we got really, really high um, and that sediment and debris was, was left behind. All right, so then I wanna talk about the Honeyway Lake Shoreline Stabilization Project we completed a couple years ago. Um, these are the before pictures. So imagine a shoreline and a lot of erosion, those roots are getting exposed from those trees um, and we really knew we had to do something. So this is in the process. So we've got Katie and myself out there doing native plantings, but you can kind of see um, we've got big rocks out in front to kind of help um, absorb some of that wave energy, kind of slow it down before it gets to that natural shoreline. And then we have soil lifts uh, wrapped in that coir fabric, which is a coconut fiber, um, that, that tan material. And so the coconut fiber is designed to kind of degrade after a few years, um, sometimes up to five or six years, um, and just kind of hold that soil in place in time for that vegetation to take, um, get those roots established. So we planted tons of native plants. And um, as you can see here, and it's just a really cool project because um, this can handle, you know, big wave energy. And it's a mixture of that rock and that nature-based shoreline uh, design. This is it. Um, I think a year or so ago, but it's even more vegetated now if you go down there to Sandy Bottom Park. Um, and we do have some signage down there too, so you'll, you won't miss it. Um, but these big rocks help prevent um, the shoreline from getting damaged from the ice, kind of slow down that wave energy, kind of absorb that energy, and then nature, the natural shoreline can do its job. Um, just a, a really cool project. 
this is a sign we had down there. Um, we have down there and it just kind of shows that that that's a really great um, zone where the wildlife can really benefit from that structure. Um, but it's not being per the wildlife can still get onto the land without a problem. And then what's really great about the native vegetation, it provides this amazing filter, right? All that stormwater that's rushing off the land. Um, maybe in a big flooding event or something, it can kind of be slowed down by that vegetation and those soil lifts. And rather than those nutrients and water just flowing directly into our waterway, um, it's going to be filtered by the vegetation first. So really cool project. Then we've got our Mill Creek uh, stream bank stabilization project. In those top photos, you can really see that heavy erosion that was occurring along Mill Creek. So um, that obviously needed, that needed help. Um, and this is part of Sandy Bottom Park. It's just the, um, you can get here easiest by the East Lake Road entrance. Um, so you can see the transition photos we have here in the bottom left, um, we use tow woods. So imagine a bunch of tree roots and trees and they're kind of crisscrossed along this shoreline. And then filled in, there's a, uh, should be some like bigger rocks and they're kind of pinning it down. And then it's wrapped in that coir fabric again, that coconut fiber, and then lots of live stakes and tree plantings along that to really establish the roots, establish that shoreline again, and you, it has really stabilized, which is great. So this is a better diagram to understand that that tow wood I'm talking about. So imagine this, the tree roots and the tree kind of crisscrossed um, and pinned using the sod and the coir fabric above it. And then the tree plantings using live stakes of um, stream co willow and red osier dogwood um, to really reestablish that shoreline. So that's a really great example. Um, another great benefit of using these nature-based designs is that that's going to provide great um, trout habitat. And we did electroshock this before um, the project was installed and then after, and we found so many trout and lots of different uh, uh, fish species within this tow wood structure. So really cool opportunity. This is Fisher's Creek in town of Victor at Fisher's Park. You can go look at. Um, on the left, you can see a lot of erosion that was occurring. And again, we use that tow wood structure and crisscross those trees, use large rocks um, sp like spaced out to kind of pin those areas really secure, wrapped in coir fabric, lots of tree plantings and live stakes and um, really cool project. And actually even what after it had been installed, um, and seeded and everything. Um, we had a big flooding event in the fall and it, it's, it was stayed intact. It was, it was doing really well. This is the Naples Creek stream bank stabilization projects. So you can see that um, a lot of erosion, a lot of debris, and we kind of brought back that floodplain. We restructured that shoreline using that tow wood, did a lot of tree plantings, used that coir fabric again. And you can kind of see through the timeline, um, even with you know a harsh winter, a lot of ice and using that floodplain, it's still very much intact. The next slide is kind of just a different view of that project. So you can kind of see that all those tree roots and um, tree plantings that are really holding that in place. All right, so you have possibly a shoreline property, you live near a waterway, and you pay property taxes, you want to have this beautiful um, little getaway on one of our beautiful Finger Lakes or tributaries. And you want to make sure that your property looks beautiful and you have it for generations to come. So when I say nature base, are you imagining this unkept uh, shrubs and trees that aren't maintained and how it's going to damage your property value. Um, and that's not the case. We want to make sure that your property is absolutely beautiful for generations to come. And I just want to talk about a few things that you can do to make sure your shoreline is um, sustained for many years, as well as keeping our water quality clean. So if you had to choose, obviously you would choose the beautiful pristine property on the left versus the harmful cyanobacteria, all those harmful algal blooms on your right that are affecting your 
property values, affecting where your dogs can swim, your children can swim, um, your boating activities, things like that. So obviously we want to have that pristine, beautiful, clean lake on the left, but it may have started that way. And now you're dealing with these harmful algal blooms and you're really concerned. So what are some things that we can do? So think about nature, all right? So we always want to revert back to how nature would kind of have it, right? If you went to a lake in the middle of nowhere where there really wasn't any civilization, you might go and put your feet in the water and there would be some aquatic um, plants on the right along there on the bottom zone. And then gradually as you go upland, you may find some more grasses and some shrubs and some some flowers, and then you may even get a lot a more riparian zone with lots of trees growing. All right. So what's really great about this is that these plants all have roots. Um, particularly native vegetation has the deepest roots. Um, our invasive or non-native species, I should say, um, tend to have shallower roots. So we do, anytime that you're picking up plants for your property, you do want to have native plants just because they have deeper roots to hold that soil in place. They don't need any fertilizer or extra nutrients. Um, and they often don't need to be watered as much either if they're planted where they're designed to be um, grown. So this is kind of how we imagined it, right? So what are our shorelines up against? Okay, we obviously have large storms. Um, we have high velocity water, ice in the winter. And then when it breaks up in the spring, that can cause a lot of damage to our shoreline wind, the waves, um, maybe there's land uses near you that are causing issues to your property. Um, there's less wetlands and floodplains in our areas that are before would have soaked up that water and now that water's rushing towards your property. Um, invasive species, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, but like the hemlock woolly adelgia, Japanese knotweed, these are all threats to our shorelines. Um, straightening of channel. Maybe humans came in and decided that that channel, that stream channel should be straighter. It could help maybe for an old mill or maybe ditches of some sort for drainage. Um, and we lost those natural meanders. Um, sometimes this happens naturally, right? Because our waterways are constantly changing and this will always be the case. Um, our waterways are always changing. The meanders are changing in a stream. Um, it's just important to understand that's ever changing. Um, it could be someone just removed a big blockage in your stream upstream um, that was debris was there for years and they just removed it and now you have tons more water and sediment flowing towards your property. Or maybe you just had a tree fall and you didn't remove it in time and it caused bigger issues. Um, upstream activity, construction, things that are happening out of your control that are affecting your property. Uh, soils, you know, different soil types could erode more easily than others. And then, of course, gravity. We can't fight gravity, but we can try to think about what are ways, if we understand gravity, how is that soil going to fall? How is that soil going to move? And what can we do to keep it structurally sound? These are some examples of what we do not want our property to look like, right? No one wants their house falling into the lake. No one wants their, their stream banks creeping towards their property, their house, and causing lots and lots of issues, all right? So this is what we want to avoid. So it's important to kind of understand these zones. So at the bottom, we have our toe zone. That toe is so important to um, keep structurally sound because as your toe kind of erodes away, everything else will fall in place. Um, then you have your bank zone and then up top you have your overbank zone. So this house is in a lot of trouble, right? The foundation is right there on that edge where that erosion is happening. They're, they're losing their deck. Um, they've been mowing right up to the edge for a long time. I wouldn't want to be mowing that yard today. Um, but that's just grass, right? So grass is, is great. Um, but it only does have roots that are a few inches. So, um, that grass isn't gonna hold that um, from any further erosion. So when it comes to stream bank and shoreline protection, we always want natural native vegetation. We want deep roots that bind that soil, right? It hugs that soil to that, that's, that bank. Uh, branches and leaves break up the wind, right? Slow down the wind and that raindrop energy. We often don't think about our leaves actually kind of um, absorbing some of that raindrop energy and allowing that water to kind of flow through that tree slower than it was in that heavy rainstorm without that tree. 
So that soft armoring protects our habitat values, um, our property. Um, it's just really great to make sure you're, again, reverting to nature. Um, gentle slopes wherever possible, right? You can kind of see where that toe at that bottom is really eroding. Um, so gradual slopes of natural shoreline absorb that wave energy without reflecting it downstream. All right, so we wanna protect that toe, make sure our, the shoreline is stabilized, but using kind of softer materials um, isn't going to reflect it and cause bigger issues. It is um, important to kind of understand a little bit about stream dynamics, especially if you live near one. Um, as you see that kind of water flowing through, it's gonna hit that outer edge um, with the highest velocity, right? And then you're going to get the deposits of sediment in those slower areas. So you can kind of see where that would be. The erosion would happen the most, um, right, where you're having the highest velocity of water on the outer edge. All right. So I do have to say you do have to stop and make sure whatever activity you're doing, you have the proper permitting. And your local soil and water conservation district can kind of guide you, um, sometimes help you even with the permitting process. Um, but you want to make sure that you um, aren't doing any activities without a permit. All right. So the Canisius Lake Watershed created this amazing stormwater toolkit, and then they allowed the Honeywell Lake Watershed Task Force to kind of um, use it and switch out information. And we put in different photos and just it's a great tool that they were willing to share share. Um, but in it, there's all this information and it kind of qualifies for most water bodies. You know, everything's going to be slightly different um, based on where you live and different regulations. But in general, you want to make sure, ask yourself, is your activity disturbing over 500 square feet? Is it going to disturb one or more acre? Um, is it adjacent to a wetland? Is it adjacent to a lake or stream? Is your activity within a floodplain? Um, is your activity going to result in more impervious surfaces? Okay, so the stormwater toolkit is a great resource that can be found at the watershed, um, honeywaylakewatershed.org website. Um, but it kind of gives you the general thing. But soil and water can help you figure out who you need to call. Um, and then the really important thing is your ordinary high water mark. So um, at Soil and Water, most Soil and Water Conservation Districts can actually go out there and do it for you. At um, Ontario County, we charge $25 and we'll come out there and mark your ordinary high water mark. Um, for Honeyway Lake, for example, it's 804 and a half feet above sea level. Okay, you can kind of see that dashed line there in the center. Um, and we can come out there and mark that. So. You would, if you're doing any sort of activity below that ordinary high water mark, um, you're going to need a joint um, permit from New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, um, for any of those activities within or along the shoreline of, for example, this one, Honeyway Lake and its tributaries. Um, so you would need to know that ordinary high water mark. All right, so hard structures, sometimes referred to as gray structures, okay? These can be completely necessary, okay? We've all seen a brick wall, whether it's concrete or metal or wood, um, but they sometimes, that's the only solution to a problem area where there's tons of wave energy or there's just unbelievable erosion. Um, and they may be completely necessary to protect our infrastructure and most importantly, our public safety. So they definitely have a purpose. The problem with these hard structures is they do reflect wave energy. All right, so um, rather than absorbing that wave energy, it just reflects it, causing more waves actually in, in our waterways. Um, there really isn't any habitat you can gain. You know, the fish aren't going to um, be able to use any aquatic species that transition or any amphibians or birds kind of transitioning into the land. Um, that nat natural photo I showed earlier, there is, this is not gonna be present. Um, so it kind of redirects the waves. Um, this property might not have an issue, but their neighboring property might because of that redirection and that energy. Uh, it can change the natural drift of loose material in our waterway. It can also increase the erosion underneath the structure or even next to. And then of course, it's not gonna have any filtration, right? If there's a parking lot right above this and you get a big rain event, any leaking oils or gases or trash or anything is just gonna drain right into our waterways. And then there's stone. So this is kind of that middleman. And 
this is uh, like riprap is a term we use a lot for this kind of stone. All right. So that does absorb some wave energy. Okay. So this is going to absorb more wave energy than that hard concrete or metal structure. Um, it's not great for wildlife habitat, right? If it's all stone, um, some wildlife could maybe benefit, but it's not that smooth transition zone uh, with vegetation that we looked at before. But if this can be completely necessary. This might be the best case scenario to keep that shoreline from eroding. Uh, this is on more uh, land structures, but sometimes they say like the word gabion baskets, and this is kind of what that would look like. So sometimes that's used along a shoreline to uh, erode, um, prevent erosion. Um, again, rock is going to help absorb some of that wave energy and not reflect all of it, but it is still a hard structure. This is an example in town of Victor where they recently did a big rock structure and it's working really, really well and it was designed well. Um, but just that's just an example. And then we've got that mixture of nature and rock. And sometimes that's just the balance you need. Um, our picture up to the left is that is that uh, sandy bottom shoreline stabilization project I talked about earlier. So that that rock is there, but it's not tightly packed, right? So water can still flow through it and it absorbs some of that wave energy. And then it gets that more nature-based shoreline um, where it can still be used as a filter. Uh, down below, that's a New York State DEC photo of a project they did near Niagara. And uh, it's still a really cool project utilizing nature and rock. And you can kind of see the, that coir fabric, these like coir logs in between the rock and that grass with all the new plantings. All right, so we kind of, this is what we kind of want to see when we talk about nature-based, right? So that submergent and emergent plants provide the underwater cover for our fish, our amphibians, birds, insects, and other organisms. And they break up that wave action, all right? So it helps prevent erosion, stabilize bottom sediments, which is really important to keep in place. Um, that prevents erosion, it stabilizes, um, and otherwise could be that all that sediment could be resuspended by currents and wave action. Um, so it's really important to, to kind of keep that vegetation when you can. All right, so this can be really beautiful, right? Having some sort of vegetated buffer between your property and your shoreline, um, that can cause um, wonderful things for our pollinator species. It's beautiful, right? Having all these beautiful perennials that are native plants that have deep roots and are gonna kind of hold that soil in place. Rather than just mowing to the edge, you have this beautiful garden along your shoreline. So that's something you could potentially um, install very easily. So another really great thing about a vegetated buffer, okay? So if you allow your grass to grow over six inches or taller, um, Canadian geese really do not prefer it. Excuse me. And um, because as you, as you can imagine, those fox and all those different predators of Canadian geese are gonna be hiding in that, in that grass. So um, geese prefer beautifully mowed yards that are mowed right up to the shoreline and that's where they're gonna they're going to prefer that um, over a, a taller, grassier, or even that that flower garden kind of filter strip. Um, again, plant native species whenever possible. Uh, it's going to help your pollinator species, carbon sequestration. It's a natural filter, um, and it just makes a great example for your neighbors. Just like um, with all the watershed coalitions and groups um, with the lake friendly living signs, actually having a sign out on your property next to something like this um, would make your neighbors ask questions and want to know more and see how how they could implement something like this on their property. A riparian buffer, um, staying true to your roots. I kind of wanted to use that because you'll remember that, right? Stay true to your roots. Roots are key. The, the tree roots are incredible for holding soil, okay? So Keep your trees whenever possible. If not, plant more trees. They provide wildlife habitat. They keep that water cool. And the cooler the water, the more dissolved oxygen for all our fish species, our macroinvertebrates, um, and the health of our waterways. The big concern with the hemlock woolly adelgid, um, this is an invasive species that's killing our hemlock trees, is that our hemlocks love 
um, living on that steep side of our gullies. And in the Finger Lakes region, we have so many gullies covered in these eastern hemlocks. And if we lose all those hemlocks, we're going to have so much more soil erosion, more nutrients going into our waterways, less filter from um, upland uh, pollution, and nothing's really going to be able to establish themselves in these bare, steep um, eroding slopes. And then live stake. So I kind of mentioned this word before. Um, usually we use stream kill willow or red osier dogwood and stakes. These are, you probably can get them for free from someone you know that has a bunch of willow or red osier dogwood where you just cut the branches and you can replant these, stick them right in the ground. You kind of want to angle them the way I have in the picture uh, for the best uh, shoreline stability. So if you've got a project like this, um, you want to make sure that you're staking them properly. They can be a little bit closer together than um, when you typically plant trees, just because you know some may not survive and you really wanna have as much root structure as possible. Um, so that's what live stakes, uh, that term means. And then can nature fail? Of course, right? Uh, nature can always fail, it happens naturally. Um, we try to do our best to, to protect our environment and um, the way it natu naturally occurs. But if you get a big extreme uh, storm, repetitive storm events, these nature-based um, practices, and they haven't been as well established yet, um, could really be affected, right? And may need some maintenance. Um, if we get a lot more increased runoff, right? More impervious surfaces, the, um, the shoreline project you did may not be able to handle it, right? Um, but the best thing you can do is kind of keep a good buffer between your new nature-based feature and your development, right? Keep that good buffer so that that shoreline can kind of stay intact and your, your house or your development isn't right next to it, right? Kind of keep a buffer. All right, so... Again, building a better sponge. I just wanna briefly talk, I don't wanna use all your time up today, but I wanna briefly talk about some healthy um, lake-friendly living tips, all right? Um, septic systems, don't overload your system. Try not to do all of your washing in one day. Try to spread it out throughout the week so you're not overloading the system where it might not, it might not properly be functioning. Uh, try not to use too many harsh or concentrated chemicals or detergents and avoid septic tank additives. I know that's kind of a hot topic, but um, sometimes septic tank additives actually break down stuff that shouldn't be broken down and in entering into our groundwater. All right, there's certain uh, that sludge really needs to stay within the septic tank and then pump it every three to five years so that it, it can actually last as long as you were hoping because septic systems are expensive. Um, on the left here in the grass, that's a perfectly maintained leach field, all right? You wanna always maintain it as grass, as a lawn. On the right there, that's a poorly functioning septic system and you have a problem if you're seeing it, it moist like that out there in your leach field. Dog waste, really big thing. You wanna make sure you're picking up dog waste. It seems silly, um, but it has like two times the amount of bacteria than human waste in it. And we wouldn't really want human waste on our lawns just left there to run off into our waterways. Um, so picking up dog waste and putting, actually picking up and throwing it in the landfill is the proper way to dispose of it. Fertilizer. So you've got, you feel like your, your lawn needs more nutrients, do a soil test. $15, $20 through Cornell. Um, Cornell Cooperative Extension can do like a basic one for you. Um, you want to make sure if it's actually needed because it's all, your, your lawn is only going to be able to use as much nutrients as it needs. So anything excess is just going to wash into our waterways and we all know that they do not need more nutrients. Cornell University did a survey and only about one in 10 lawns actually needs any fertilizer. Uh, one pound of phosphorus in the lake can spur the growth of 500 pounds of aquatic plants. So you want to make sure if you are using any sort of fertilizer, that zero is in the middle because it's always in the order of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. All right. So um, it's usually actually illegal to use phosphorus on just a normal lawn, um, but you want to look for the zero in the middle. 
And lawns afford much less infiltration than fields, pasture, or forests, right? Um, if you had a big hay field or a cornfield or a forest, it's going to soak in a lot more water um, than your lawn that's, you know, mowed regularly. But lawns typically receive about 10 times the amount of concentration of fertilizer as farm fields. Um, we often, you know, just think about the fertilizer or the manure on our farm fields and we go, oh, that's got to be the issue. But a lot of the time, lawns actually receive quite a bit more fertilizer and concentration than our local farmers actually use. Um, if you have a pest, figure out if this is something that you can live with. Is it a good pest? You know, is it a good insect that you can, that's actually beneficial for your property? Um, or is it something that you do need to deal with um, and try to do it early as possible? Sometimes manual removal um, can, can work. Uh, Cornell has a whole integrated pest management pro um, program with all sorts of resources, um, but make sure you remember not all bugs are bad. Check the weather anytime you're using chemicals or any sort of nutrient on your property that um, you're, it's not gonna just rain and wash it all away. Planting disease resistant seed, cutting grass no less, less than um, three inches in height is optimal uh, for um, your roots as well as keeping your grass really healthy. Um, it won't uh, dry out as quickly as well. Keeping your mower blade sharp is key because shredding your grass blade tips are just going to invite disease in. Leave any clippings on your lawn for natural fertilizer. Mow over your leaves a couple times in the fall, and that's just going to be natural fertilizer. And then driveway slope. I don't want to use up all your time, but... Um, Making sure you're aware of your, your driveway or if you're building a new driveway or any type of um, steep slope, you want to make sure that you're really minimizing that. And soil and water can kind of help you figure out what soil types you have. Sometimes you may need to use some sort, sort of water bar or some sort of um, diversion so that if you have a steep driveway, that water can be um, kind of flow in a certain area where it can then be go on to establish vegetation rather than just rushing off your surface. Um, and angling your driveway across a steep slope rather than along with the, stroke, the slope um, will really help to intercept runoff. These are some like do it yourself examples of some water bars using like old guardrails or even um, a conveyor belt just to kind of stop that water as it's running across your steep driveway and kind of divert it into a vegetated area. Same goes for logging. If you're planning on logging your property, New York State has a really good guide for the best management practices to really um, make sure you're logging any logging activities, you're using all those best management practices. Rain barrels, using a rain barrel to kind of conserve your water and use that stormwater before it leaves your property is a really great tool. And then just reducing your waste. Just last year, we helped recycle over 21 tons of residential tires. Um, anything you can do to reduce your waste, um, reuse things whenever possible, um, just diverting from landfills is, is key for our environment. Composting, another great way to divert uh, waste from our landfill. And then car washing. The main thing here is just trying to use a commercial car wash whenever possible because they're required by law to make sure their water is treated. Um, but if you do have to wash your car at home, try to do it in the lawn where it can kind of soak it up like a sponge rather than all the, the dirt and debris and salt running down your driveway. All right. Making sure you dispose of everything in a proper household hazardous waste or e-waste, things like that. But the, just try to do the best you can. Be aware of your impact. Um, if you have more questions that you feel like you want more information on, but you don't want to ask today, um, I'd be happy to, to get you to the right person. Um, at our office, we have, there's eight, we have eight employees and we all... Um, work together to make sure we're helping our community. We have lots of information on our website, like recent projects we've done, if you wanna learn more about that. Um, but other than that, that is it for me. Lindsay, if, you, um, if we have any questions or anything or anything else you wanted me to add. Here we go. Well, thank you, thank you Elena, that was wonderful.
Oh, great. Um, you covered a lot in a short period of time. I'm super impressed. So thank you for that. <laughs> yep. um, we do have a few questions. So, and we've got about five minutes. So we'll try and go through the ones that we have here, both in the Q&A in the chat. But just one comment on your presentation. I really liked the comment you made about how we can all make a great example for our neighbors. I think you offered so many good solutions and things for us to think about as watershed residents. And by implementing more nature-based solutions, I, it's my hope that that will encourage our neighbors to do the same. So I really just appreciated that perspective. Okay, so uh, getting into the questions, uh, the first one came from Frank Moses. So Frank is from Skinny Atlas Lake. And his question is, uh, do you know what types of native plant vegetation come in, come in the hydroseeding mix? And are there salt tolerant species included to help ensure nutrient uptake is optimized along salty roadside ditches? Wow, that's a really great question. I can actually, what we can do is follow up with an email and I can get you specific species um, answers that are a little bit more salt tolerant too. So that's, that's a really good one. I can follow back up with you on that one. Great, and maybe we can even put together a little resource sheet because I noticed in your presentation you had some great links in there too. So um, we have all of our registrants email information. So I'd be happy to, to share some resources. Uh, Perfect. Lynn, next question, uh, Lynn Klotz, have you or anyone been able to measure the acreage taken out of production for water retention equals or exceeds the cost of farmer losing that soil, seed, herbicides, and pesticides? So any sort of like cost benefit analysis. Do you know of any kind of research that documents that? We haven't done any specific research on um, like how much acreage that needs to be taken out in order to do that. Um, I know there is the Soil Health um, Institute and they have been doing a lot of um, research studies with local farmers and um, like they brought in local farmers from our area and they did like several years of research and showed um, different projects they've implemented, different like cover cropping acres they've done and then showed how much money they saved. Um, so I can like send it as a link to show like, because it does take quite a few years and a lot of uh, data to collect a study like that. Um, but I could I could share something like that because it's pretty cool to see how much money they save um, using all these amazing soil health practices and different ag BMPs. Okay, so I'm going to pull up the chat here. I think we maybe have time for maybe two more. Um, a lot of great uh, praise for your presentation. So thanks, Elena. Thanks. Um, Mary asks, can I use 30 to 40 percent vinegar? on my weeds near my lake fronts? It's a good question. I've heard, I've heard 10%, but um, I don't know. Do you have any information, Elena, uh, on that? Um, I've tried to use vinegar on different things. It's really hard to find vinegar that concentrated. Um, usually, I, I don't even know what the concentration at the store is, but it's much lower than that. Um, obviously, vinegar is going to be a little bit safer than other chemicals, but I would still um, be more aware of like if you're right on your property, if you think about, you know, our fish species and things like that, could they handle 40% concentration of vinegar? Probably not. Um, sometimes they recommend if you're using like a lower vinegar, I've heard of mixing like a dish soap and a water with it. And that dish soap can kind of help it hold on to the leaf, whatever weed you're trying to kill. Um, so there's different practices out there, but I think it, lots of people use vinegar as like a natural alternative, but I would still just be aware anytime you're spraying next to a waterway, if it's going to get into that waterway, just be careful. Yes. Okay. And so looking at the time, let's do one more because it's almost one o'clock. I'm actually going to maybe merge two questions here. Um, so Carolyn asks, um, does soil and water work with landscapers to promote better practices? And then kind of building onto that, um, Linda was had a question on, is there a listing of native plant species to create a buffer at the shoreline? So um, yeah, so just information on how soil and water maybe interacts with landscapers, if you do. Um, and then what are some resources for us to get some native plant species lists? 
Oh, yeah. Um, we haven't worked like directly with like landscaping companies, but we definitely work with a lot of contractors, um, a lot of contractors that are required to install green infrastructure projects on recent construction, um, like rain garden. Sometimes, you know, the engineer puts together a big plan for a new construction project and they said, OK, you need a rain garden here. You need a stormwater retention area here, things like that, um, maybe even porous pavement. Um, so we work a lot with um you know companies like that with our four-hour course and we talk a lot about green infrastructure um we work with our local ontario wayne storm water coalition and we're always doing outreach to the community on you know those best management practices for managing storm water um, so that would include local um, companies like that um, and then I can, what I can do is in those resources, send you a few links on finding native plants. Sometimes it is challenging to find native plants. Um, I know like Prism, like Finger Lakes Prism has done a lot of work in trying to get landscaping companies to not sell invasive plants. Um, it's still very common to find plants that are not native. Um, I know there's a few nurseries in kind of the Springwater, Naples area that have been working hard to just because I'm from that area um, that have been working hard to put, be promoting more native plants, which is great. Um, but sometimes it's not going to be New York native. It's going to be Northeast native or um, it's going to be the Eastern Coast kind of native. Um, but a simple Google search when you have a plant in mind will help you. Um, the main thing is you want to make sure you're not establishing something that shouldn't be from around here or even from another country that could cause issues um, within it being invasive. So I can send out some links to some native plants you can look into. Great. Thanks, Elena. I really appreciate um, you sharing your time today. Uh, one last I, more like a comment, we need to get municipalities to implement nature-based solutions. I think a lot of us would agree, and I know that Soil and Water is working really hard with our municipal partners, as is our uh, Canandaigua Lake Watershed Council and the Honeywood Lake Watershed Task Force, to, to try and encourage more nature-based solutions. So good comment. Absolutely. There. Great. So, um, great. Well, this was an hour, and I feel like we covered a lot, so appreciate your time today. Thank you all for joining the webinar. I um, encourage you guys to check out the other events we have coming up and Elena and I will put together a resource list for you and uh, send it out and we'll also announce the winner of our LED flare contest in an email too. So appreciate you guys logging on today to uh, for this lunch and learn. Have a good afternoon everyone. Thanks everyone.